Up. Okay, the coach is not me, but as you said, man is seven in Italian output. Up. Pile, kissing me, amiga, chilo, pop. I think we'll move that one. Pile? <laughs> no, no. You want to go here? Yeah. Just say the word. Up. 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 Anna, pile, if you pop, to check. This is a okay, okay, chilo, not see you, look, penny the bat. See you, look, my second in a slender rat of pop. You know, battle sinne, a good tissue so. Davaru Tessamani Nayobut Pele Broba, Miriam Collin, Davaru Sven Hartenberg, Online Kutlu, Ama Gudmondua, Alfredson, Islene Minganit Nayobo. You know the Gender. Quina was swap, suit long mic, the Messi, we are also Pessi, the Cusimeresi, Nuenra, Dam the Kutrachi, Ali, in Upesu, my sexual issue. Una to do two in a thesawa to do two sanga, the matter to do two sawood. Nero poo, nutteriso, nutteris, nutti sweat, nutti, nutteris sweat, canon. Nutter to a sagad, Goyan our swag, Isaac. Thank you very much, everyone, to, uh, for showing up. Um, we've looked very much forward to, to this day and uh, to have this panel to talk about some very, very important uh, issues for Inuit in Greenland. Uh, I have a very, very exciting panel with me here today. I have Gudmundur Alfredson from uh, Iceland, um, an Icelandic lawyer who uh, is an expert in international law and human rights. And I have with me Sven Hardenberg. Uh, Netflix uh, star here on the stage and also a very successful entrepreneur in Greenland. And I have Miriam Cullen from New Zealand who is an uh, associate professor and a guest lecturer at Edis Madrasafik, the University of uh, Greenland. And then I have Pele Popa who has uh, done an amazing introduction himself earlier, so I won't be saying much there. So this panel, um, the title is Greenlandic Independence, the International Legal Framework, and Inuit Identity. So the reason for the choice of that title is, as we've heard, the history of Greenland, the, the colonial history, uh, has to be seen in a context where racism is part of the conversation. So. The fact that we have Inuit today, Galatlit, uh, and the fact that we have we seem to have some confusion in terms of the uh, of the words or the terms we use. So today it's been uh, a very it's, it's become a very confusing term to say Greenlander uh, because it's been muddied uh, because of the fact that that we are a population, we're parts of the the Greenlandic population. Uh, has been mixed with, uh, with Europeans and Danish people, and that we have Danish people here. So the fact that a lot of people don't really know what the term Greenlandic means, that we don't have a clear definition, uh, is why it's important to talk about identity. So I think we'll just uh, get into it, and I would like to, to open with, uh, with Gudmundur. And uh, Gudmundur, you are... Uh, an expert in, in international law and, and human rights. I would love for you to maybe start this panel off with uh, explaining to us uh, in broad terms, from your opinion as an expert in international law and human rights, uh, the framework and the possibilities for, for independence for Greenland, Greenland and the Greenlandic people. And as an expert in international law and human rights, uh, the framework 
and the possibilities for for independence for Greenland, Greenland and the Greenlandic people. Good afternoon to all of you and, and, uh, and uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. And the possibilities for, for independence for Greenland. There is a little Greenland problem the with the sound coming my way. I have been, uh, it's, it's nice, it's nice to hear from you, too, uh, but everything you say, uh, thanks for the invitation. And, and now everything I say, for, I hear it two or three times. It's coming over the loudspeaker with the sound coming my way. And the sound is very unclear. I just want to I just want to point out that there's uh, a lot of noise in the background. It might be because of uh, the the sound. Um, and is now we can't hear you. <laughs> uh, a lot of noise in the background. It might be because of uh, the, the sound. Um, anyway, you know, I have lowered my sound, so I'm not being disturbed by it. Can't hear you. <laughs> I want to say thanks for the invitation. You have certainly chosen a good date to look at uh, the situation of Greenland with a 70 year anniversary of the in integration. I want to say thanks for the invitation. And uh, looking at the international law status of Greenland, sort of looking at from the issues from a legal point of view, the, the Greenland people, the Greenlanders, are in a good position under both international law and Danish law. Uh, under international law, Greenland was listed as a colony or a non-self-governing territory with the UN. And in 1953, supposedly that situation, that colonial situation was brought to an end and the Greenland was integrated. There was a lot of problems with that process, no options were given. Uh, the Greenland Council that took the decision did not have a constitutional mandate. The council didn't even have representatives from all of Greenland. We got two or three days to discuss the matter. There was a referendum in Denmark, but Can you hear no me? referendum in Greenland. And on top of it all, if you look at the information submitted by Denmark to Greenland, Good to Can you hear me? Stopping of reporting. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. There, there seems there seems to be a problem with the sound, and uh, I don't know if it has to do with. The, is it the sound system here, or is it uh, the, the sound in it? Okay. So, so I think we. I'm hearing that you might need to to put uh, your headphones on so that there's no. Uh, the, the sound that you're putting out is not caught by the the computer. So. Is it is a possibility for you to put headphones on? To put uh, your headphones on so that there's no uh, the, the sound that you're putting out is not caught by the the computer. So, is it is a possibility for you to put headphones on? I would love to put on headphones, but I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think maybe we uh, we can uh, continue the panel, um, and if. I don't know if there's a solution to this because it's, it seems to be that the, the, the sound is not right from, uh, from your end and it's necessary to, to maybe find some, some headphones. So I think we'll continue the panel um, to get the most out of this uh, conversation as possible. But thank you, Gudmundur, for, for showing up. Um, and I hope that you will follow now. If it is possible for you to head, find headphones, I'd love to encourage you to do that. Uh, but we'll continue the panel here as it is right now. Thank you. You, you can hear it and it's distinguishable? Okay. So, good morning. Good the sound is not optimal, but, but please continue uh, finishing your, your thoughts. You, you. No, basically, I was saying uh, you have, uh, as a matter of international law, a good position. And on top of it, okay. in the Danish self-governance legislation, the right of self-determination is also guaranteed. You have, uh, as a matter of international law, a good position. And on top of it, in the Danish self-governance legislation, the right of self-determination is also guaranteed. And I know I sound very convincing because I can hear myself three times saying everything, 
and I stop here. Thank you. All right. I think uh, just I think we'll continue with with the panel right now. There there's too much uh, there's too much uh, going on with the sound right now, so it's not optimal. I think I'll continue with the <laughs> with the panel up up here that's physically present. Um, so Miriam, I would uh, I would love to to ask you in your capacity as uh, someone who engages with uh, also with human rights in a way in international law. Um, how would you describe the frame, framework that we have or the possibilities for Greenland to become independent and in which ways? So, um, thank you for the question. Uh, I was anticipating that Goodmunder would cover this stuff, so I'm just going to shoot from the hip and sort of cover what I think Goodmunder was saying and hopefully um, get some head nods from Goodmunder as I go. Um, but my understanding is that the process of decolonization that was implemented by the UN was one in which Denmark was a number of territories listed as non-self-governing at the time. Um, ultimately, the conclusion under international law for um, decolonization is for a non-self-governing territory with three options. One is that you become independent, one is that you become a freely associated state, and the third is that integration into the coloniser state. Very few chose the latter. In the process of decolonization that occurred in 1953, as I understand it, there, were, uh, there was a question that was asked of the um, Danish appointed council that governed here some things. They did not have a mandate to decide this type of matter and were given only a couple of days to consider the matter. Um, the Greenlandic people were not asked, uh, so it was a decision made by the council itself, which in some ways I think makes questionable right that process of decolonization. And some would say that your rights as a colonial people didn't really... Um, shift with that particular process, um, that people weren't consulted, that um, requirement of the decision being informed, being consultative, being a free choice of the people concerned was not um, engaged in, in that decision. So uh, yet that's the state of affairs from 1953. There was a decision of that council to integrate into Denmark and since then um, that was the end of um, the colonisation process. The UN has always viewed with some suspicion the um, process of integration into the coloniser state over processes of free association or potentially independent statehood. And so when we think about what that means for human rights today, there were processes of reporting that Denmark was obliged to engage in under Article 73 of the UN Charter to give reports on are they improving the lives of these people in these non-self-governing territories. You know, accountability was there and that was lost at the moment that Greenland became integrated in, as a state, as a um, uh, territory within Denmark. Today there is still human rights reporting going on. I'm sure that some of you are aware that as early as February this year you had the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Rights come and examine the relationship between Greenland and Denmark in relation to whether human rights are being complied with and he expressed a great number of concerns. And I think one of the things that you have to think about when you're thinking about human rights is that as long as Greenland remains a territory within the realm of Denmark, then you're entitled to your human rights being realised uh, in an equal footing to Danes. So you have a right to a standard of living, to health care, to, um, to these kinds of human rights on an equal footing to Danes. And where there is a system of oppression that has been in place for a period of time, where things have been inequitable, then principles of equity rather than just equality apply. And that might require further investment or further support of those people who have been oppressed than for the majority population who haven't suffered that oppression. Equity demands that more is done. So those would be some quick remarks on human rights and international law broadly. Great, thank you. And I should maybe uh, point out that the whole panel was, uh, was attending the free association seminar that was uh, held at Elisabeth Rosafik on the, the 24th of May. And it was a very, very exciting and, and very interesting, uh, interesting seminar. And I'd, lo I'd love to pass it on to you, Pele. Um, after having that seminar, uh, going through the whole motions with, uh, in terms of how free association is a possibility for Greenland to use, 
and that independence or becoming a nation state and a sovereign state for Greenland is actually something that's tangible and something that we can, uh, uh, you know, that we can realistically strive for and, and work towards. What are your comments in terms of what we heard partly from, from Gudmund and, and Miriam uh, and uh, what you learned from the Free Association seminar? Well, thank you very much for, I was about to say, having me today when I'm paying for it. <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you very much for asking me that question. One of the important aspects that I found out is that no matter how hard we try, the goalpost will be moved. Uh, today, what Julia Hardenberg has done put me in a state of emotion that I didn't quite expect to get. I have seen all her works, or most of them, and they just hit deep. And what Lars Jensen also said, this is not an equal footing at all. So, in my view, what we heard on the uh, Free Association seminar always lead up to, we have to defend ourselves, why we want the independence. We always have to justify, and more importantly, finance how we envision the future. Which again, as I said, the goalpost keeps being moved. And in my view, we, we are at a crossroads where we either give up independence and become Danish citizens on equal terms with all the rest of the Danes in the Kingdom of Denmark, or something else is being done by the international community. Because as Lars said, <laughs> The goalpost has been moved all the way from 53 to 2023. For the last 70 years, we haven't gotten anywhere. We don't even have an identity. I cannot claim to be Inuit because I can't document it. I do know people tend to talk about their feelings when they say it, but by law, the identification process doesn't exist. So the Greenlandic people is just a term that is being used, and I, I have to say, I agree with uh, Lars Jensen, to delay independence. That's what the self-governing rule has become, and I feel that's what free association will become. It will be yet another project that we'll talk about for 20 years, how to do this and all that, instead of making the first decision, do we want independence, yes or no? If it's a yes, then we start the process and we get out of the Kingdom of Denmark, as fast as possible. And then we'll figure out the rest from there. But again, it doesn't seem like anybody is interested in actually achieving that goal except a very few uh, politicians in Greenland and certainly none in Denmark. Yeah, so I, I think I want to uh, ask the, the question because every time we talk about Greenlandic independence or Greenland becoming a nation state, um, as things are right now, um, there are always these recur reoccurring uh, or recurring questions or uh, arguments that, that are being used, and they always have uh, to do with economy. So, what is there to say about uh, the conversations that we have in society? And, and we, we've heard from Danish politicians uh, that have made headlines that um, the Greenland can forget everything about uh, ex uh, uh, expecting to have some financial support if Greenland chooses to become independent. So what is there, and this is a question for, for all of you, you can chip in if you, if you want, all of you. Um, what is there to say about that? Like th those conversations that, that occur when arguments are being presented about the economy being in the way, that we cannot become independent if we are not uh, economically, um, uh, Self-sufficient, yeah. Sved, I, I'd love to hear uh, your take on that. Yes, um, thank you. Well, I think the whole construct and the narrative is wrong that we are following because it all tends to be a discussion about how would you manage such uh, independence uh, reality uh, when you cannot even support yourselves. And they're always referring to the block grant that is around 3.6, well now maybe 4.1 billion Danish kroner. 
that is not a lot of money. It's a lot of money for one person or persons when you're discussing it, because we don't earn that much money in a lifetime as a private person or family. Um, but for a state, a country, with all the resources that we're sitting on, it's nothing. And I think, I think we are fooled into the false uh, construct that it's all about money. No, it's not. It's about making it a decision uh, and then making it happen. Because we are 56,000 inhabitants in the biggest island in the world with all the resources that we are sitting on. And when we heard uh, on the last um, discussion we had about free association models, it was, I was amazed about the variety of differences that are in the solutions for a free association agreement and also how they are financed. And it was amazing for me to, to learn that our block grant is so small in regards to all the other types of agreements other countries have with the sovereign state. And I, w I felt very uh, at ease in regards to our own process because we have all that history to build on when we're looking at different solutions. And I think that totally lacks in the discussions that we are going to have about what are our options. I think that could be very, very interesting to, uh, to investigate much further. Hmm. And Miriam, I'd, I'd love to hear your take on, like, um, you are well-versed uh, in terms of a free association. I know that in New Zealand, um, as you've explained in many of our talks, uh, that the, the model that they use in New Zealand, uh, interestingly, interestingly, where um, there is no constitution for those indigenous people uh, living in New Zealand, um, can you can you refresh how that uh, setup looks like? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. I should have mentioned I was so nervous to follow Goodmunder that I didn't thank you for inviting me, and I didn't introduce myself as a settler woman from Aotearoa, New Zealand, who's an you know interloper here in Greenland and immigrant in Denmark. Um, so you know I speak here neutrally and without political favor, but really just to bring you knowledge of of work that that I've been working on in this um, space. I'm a lawyer, I'm a human rights lawyer, so I work, and I've worked in the past with indigenous peoples in um, Australia in particular, but also to some extent in New Zealand. Anyway, to get to the question though, um, so New Zealand has obviously its Māori population, which is the indigenous peoples of New Zealand, with whom there is a treaty between the New Zealand government and the chiefs uh, of the Māori in um, uh, in the early part of the 19th century. That's one arrangement which I can get into, but we've often talked about what's interesting about New Zealand in terms of its relationship with Māori is that, especially right now, tikanga Māori principles, so the, the philosophies that underpin what it is to be Māori, are in, and uh, as a matter of law, are incorporated um, in a pluralist system. So they sit alongside um, the predominantly British colonial system. Make no mistake, British law is, you know, the, the Commonwealth legal system is dominant, um, but there is the Waitangi Tribunal, which decides land claims for Māori, and tikanga legal precepts and principles are now being applied in courtrooms um, fairly regularly and, uh, and are applied in Māori-specific issues. So there are, is a lot of movement in New Zealand towards tikanga Māori law being incorporated alongside colonial law. In addition, New Zealand has relationships when it took over some of the British colonies in the Pacific. So it sort of, um, the Cook Islands, Niue and Tokelau became part of the dominion of New Zealand within the New Zealand realm. And so the relationship New Zealand has with Niue and with the Cook Islands is one of free association, which means that the people of the Cook Islands got to make a decision about whether they wanted to continue a relationship with New Zealand in one way or another. And as part of their decolonization process in 1965, agreed with New Zealand that they wanted to be in free association and they brought that to the United Nations. That relationship of free association doesn't actually sit on a treaty. It's, it's the first one that existed and they didn't have sort of a setup. Um, but what it gave to the Cook Islands is all of the elements of statehood. 
So independent decision making, its own governance, while maintaining a relationship with New Zealand, such that New Zealand government agreed and expects to continue this in perpetuity to provide money to the Cook Islands under a constitutional arrangement. New Zealand government acts for the Cook Islands in security and foreign affairs only when the Cook Islands gives its consent and instruction that New Zealand may so act. Otherwise, New Zealand does not have a say, right? Often there are discussions between the two. There are friendly relations between Cook Islands and New Zealand, but it's Cook Islands that gets to make that final decision. So that makes that quite a unique arrangement. What's important about money, though, in this, the Cook Islanders remain New Zealand citizens for the time being. If Cook Islands wanted to institute its own citizenship, it could but it hasn't elected to. New Zealand citizenship gives Cook Islanders, who number today about 15,000, so not many people, free access to come and go from New Zealand. In New Zealand, about 80,000 people identify as Cook Islanders. What New Zealand takes from that is that because these citizens are part of the New Zealand realm, then New Zealand has obligations to uphold the human rights of its citizens all across the realm, which will require funding adequate to make that happen so that Cook Islanders enjoy a standard of living, access to adequate food, access, um, you know, a standard of uh, adequate health care that all equal the New Zealand standard as best possible. And so the New Zealand government will change the amount that it gives to the Cook Islands every three years so that su there's sufficient planning for future budgets, um, but also so that when there is a higher need, such as recently when COVID hit, New Cook Islands is almost completely dependent on tourism for its um, economic stability. When COVID hit, tourism took a significant drop and the um, Cook Islands economy really collapsed. New Zealand more than doubled its um, monetary assistance to the Cook Islands in that context. I say this because I'm trying to give you creative options for the way that you might engage in negotiations, well aware that the feeling is that Denmark isn't willing to move. But the thing about law and about constitutional arrangements is that it's often slow, right? You know, every long journey starts with a single step. And so what I think would be a shame would be if you completely cut off all of the different kinds of options available only because you sense a lack of political will right now. Also, I'm giving this example in the context of being here and in thinking hopefully about the future. That is not to say that New Zealand is somehow perfect or has it done it all right or that there isn't harms that have been uh, and continue to be um, put upon New Zealand Māori and other Indigenous peoples within the realm. Um, rather, it's just to give you like a hopeful thought of, of ideas for moving forward. Yeah, I think... I I'd love to, to point to the fact that um, it, was po it was kind of joked around after the, the free association or during that, um, I think one of the presenters uh, joked that we might consider making a free association deal or agreement with New Zealand. Um, the, fact that, the fact that the Cook Islands have full say in terms of security and defense uh, and uh, that New Zealand as a state can only act upon uh, security and, and, and defense issues when they have uh, agreement or consent from the Cook Islands. Pele, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, uh, on like the, the differences that are very apparent between Greenland and, and uh, New Zealand in terms of, of that whole setup? Well, first off, uh, we have been told many times that we cannot become uh, a state or even go down the free association path because we're only 56,000. We need to be more people. This is a prime example of why that's just not true. Uh, but the second part is that I do feel that since the election in 2018 where we proposed a plan for actually doing free association negotiations with Denmark, because we actually, like Miriam suggested, wanted to keep some form of relations with Denmark. Since then, we feel that all the bridges have been burned by politicians on both sides, Danish and Greenlandic. They don't want to go down that road for several reasons. One of them being that uh, we want complete independence. That's the word we get as excuse from 
most politicians in Greenland. And from the Danes, well, you don't want to have anything to do with us. That's the only reason why you're talking independence. So the, it's an either or uh, kind of debate that is going on. That either we stay as Danish citizens and under the Danish rule, or we cut off from Denmark. And one of the interesting th facts is that during a free association seminar, the Faroese politician actually told them how they managed to screw up that whole process with Denmark because they gave them the tools they needed in order to postpone or stop the process, saying, we don't want to compromise on our economic situation. And I'm not in a position where I can actually say what the Greenlandic people want, but I do know that from a negotiation point, unless you're willing to cut all ties with Denmark, as they propose, because they want to punish us if we want to become independent, unless we're willing to do that, we, we cannot move forward and we cannot wait another 40 years because that's uh, clearly shown in statistics that the longer you drag out independence, the less willing uh, politicians will become to actually do something about uh, independence. But make no mistake, from Nella, we would love to begin the negotiations tomorrow for a free association deal. But unless other political parties in Greenland want to do the same, all the Danish politicians, then the next logical step would be just to go for the independent part, cut the ties with Denmark completely. But it, it is an interesting uh, point to get across that we have examples of people using this. It's not a smoke screen that is being used uh, politically. It's clear-cut facts. In free association, as Gudmundur has been talking for since I think it was 83, is actually something other people in other countries are using. But for some reason, people don't want to talk about it up here. So it is kind of interesting to hear what, is, what Miriam is uh, telling in this sense. And also that goes in concert with what was asked earlier, uh, which laws that apply in Greenland. Uh, and as Lars said, is there actually any laws in Greenland that are suitable in Greenland? I'm not even sure there are. So it is an interesting point. Sven, what are your, what are your thoughts around this? Well, I, I, I think we're too focused about what Denmark thinks. And that's always a reference for most political discussions. I would like to advocate for that uh, we start to look inwards and start to define what we want. What are our wishes and what do we want to base this on? I think the first step that we did with the draft constitutions is very crucial because it starts to uh, mature our own view on the process. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very interested to see the process about debating it uh, and start to adjust it because personally I, I, I've, I've read it a couple of times and I, I think there's some room for improvement, but come on, we are that far already. And I think we should focus much, much more on our own process. That's at least what I would like to put out there, instead of hearing what other things, especially Danish state or the parliament in Denmark and so forth. Thank you, Thank you for those uh, important points. Uh, Liam? Thanks. I just wanted to add something. Before I came here, I was thinking really hard about what I could share from research and from my Indigenous colleagues who share with me their experiences of these kinds of processes. And one thought that I thought we didn't, we talked about a little at the free association seminar, but not enough, was that in order to decide whether you want to be freely associated or be independent or, or be integrated, it needs to be an informed choice by the people, which usually will require some kind of referendum and usually will require a majority to make that decision. How do you know what the majority wants? How do you find out what people want? And one of the messages that I've received about this process from people who have engaged in it, so rather than me, but from my good colleagues who are Indigenous scholars working elsewhere, is that um, that might require a changing of the way that you find out about what other people are thinking and feeling. These processes often require at once a shift in political structure at the same time as you are decolonizing yourself, right? As you are personally engaged in this process, which can be extremely hard and profoundly personal. 
I wanted to pick up on something Lars spoke about earlier, which was the Uluru Statement, because there was a really interesting dialogue process that happened as part of that, in which um, Aboriginal leaders from many different communities were brought together. The people excluded from the room were the lawyers and the politicians and anybody who's traditionally loud so that people who are quiet, who are less confident about speaking their voices, but who are part of a silent majority sometimes, got to say stuff. And it was a three-day process. The people, all professional facilitators were pushed out, all lawyers pushed out, except I think one or two Indigenous lawyers who were already part of the process, for the sake of having this very open dialogue. And the premise, the starting point for that discussion was that everybody disagrees. Everybody disagrees about how we should move forward, but let's talk about what we value. Let's talk about who we are. Let's talk about this much more basic understanding of ourselves, and then let's come forward. And what they came up with was a model that no constitutional lawyer had designed. They had ideas that despite the best minds in law and legal systems and sort of colonial processes, they hadn't thought of it. And that's what's happening at this referendum later this year in Australia is this voice to parliament, which was directly from the voices of the Indigenous peoples of Australia, of Aboriginal Australians. So there are different ways to do things. And I think part of the decolonisation process is recognition that all of this that we're doing, all of the legal system, all of the way that we're used to engaging is an inheritance from coloniality, right? It's, it's part of that inheritance. And that it's okay to really flip the switch, really get radical about the, you know, in at least to a col coloniser eye, <laughs> bring back some of your traditions and ways of doing things that haven't been engaged with so much in the past in order to derive unity. The other place that I've worked besides with these communities is at the International Criminal Court, where I have seen in the Office of the Prosecutor the worst end of the other end of the scale, where processes for independence go profoundly wrong and end up in violence and end up in the worst end. So it's so important, I think, that as you move forward with such profoundly sensitive discussions, that you focus on the unity you can bring to your people rather than dividing your people, which, which you know, there's many examples can be dangerous. I'd, I'd love to pick up on some of the stuff you, you said now, and it, this is where it might be a, a bit tenseful, uh, because the, the title of this, this panel is precisely Greenlandic Independence and also the aspect of Inuit identity. So if we agree that, that colonial systems and structures are uh, in their essence racist, and they, they have uh, a racist background since colonization is a project that stems from Europe and ideas of, uh, of races and races of people who are uh, in, in specific relations to each other where some are at the top, Euro white Europeans and indigenous black and, and brown people are at the bottom. Um, so where identity becomes important in this conversation uh, is the fact that, uh, and this has been uh, debated quite uh, lively here uh, lately, and I, I don't think that debate is going to um, disappear anytime soon. So the fact that the Greenlandic people uh, formally lost their identity in 1953. So we became Danish citizens. And to this day, we are Danish citizens. And we've seen examples where... Uh, um, we have one example where uh, a Greenlandic student, an Inuit student, went to uh, Canada to study, and she needed some form of document, uh, that the proof that she was Inuit, because they have a system in Canada where, um, where Inuit or indigenous people have their rights protected, and that you need to be um, part of, of Inuit community and be registered as an Inuk to get access to those, uh, to those rights. So she contacted the, the, the Greenlandic system. She went to uh, the, uh, both the government and, and the municipality. And she, it was not possible for her to get documentation of her being Inuit or Inuk. Uh, and this ties into what you said before, Peel. Um, what is there to say about the importance of identity in this context? Uh, accept, accepting the premise that we do have racism in this world and that indigenous 
uh, in Inuit people um, have not full sovereignty of their land and are still under a Danish state, which is a colonial state. What is there to say about Inuit identity in, in that regard? Pila, I'd love to, to start with you. Well, I've noticed a lot of times that when we are at arrangements like this, not just here, other places as well, people have a tendency to be delicate about, for instance, as Miriam said, claiming and proclaiming they're settlers. They're not native to the country. In Greenland, Danish people here won't even say they're settlers. They claim they're Greenlanders. They, they are claiming the identity of Inuit. For instance, ICC, which is the organization that is supposed to be for Inuit rights, have members of it that are not Inuit. They're not even claiming to be Inuit. And if you look at the identity debate, it becomes important only for one reason, self-determination, nothing else. Let's say that we reach the sa a state where we actually get uh, citizenship in Greenland, then the debate would be, how can others get citizenship? But unless we get the identity debate cleared out of the way first, it's very difficult to actually get what Miriam said, a room for people that are not politicians and lawyers, to sit down and talk about this, because you would get a room full of Danes saying, telling what they want. And asking a colonizer what he wants to do with his colony is not fruitful for a debate. So you would have to figure out who to let into that room. And we actually have a talk about this where we're trying to not say, we don't like you here, we don't want you here, we don't want to take away your rights. We're just trying to have a debate where we actually say, the Greenlandic people needs an identity, either an independent scenario or continuing under the Danish rule because indigenous peoples have rights. But today we don't have indigenous peoples in Greenland. As you mentioned with Nivi, she also asked ICC for help. They didn't want to help her either. So it is a profound strangeness we find ourselves in with something so simple as proof of indigenous heritage. Because as we know in Article 1 of the indigenous people's rights, it states quite clearly, you have to have that uh, heritage in order to be Inuit, for instance, indigenous. That doesn't mean we can't figure out a solution to include people that are not naturally or born Inuit. We have examples with uh, adopt ad adaptation and stuff like that. But it, needs, it means we need to have a beginning to this discussion. Where it ends is a completely different matter. And it has everything to do with indigenous people's rights. I know that. But we have to tie it into the uh, addendum seven of what the Danish government and the Greenlandic Home Rule made for the commission of the Greenlandic Self-Rule for 2009, where they actually said the definition of the Greenlandic people is the same as the definition of indigenous peoples in Greenland which is the Inuit, the native population of uh, Greenland. And you also have Chaplinsky that has done the same study with former colonies, primarily in Africa, where they said the new citizenship was for the native population of the country, while the settlers kept their metropole status. In a different light, we would say this way. If you are Danish, coming to Greenland and we became independent, you would still keep your Danish citizenship. The Greenlanders would get the new identity. If you're born up here by Danish parents, well, you will have your proof of, how do you put it mildly, you are relevant in Greenland, you have your heart in Greenland, you want to be Greenlandic, well, then you can apply for the citizenship the second we have that. But until then, then it's a Danish law stating if one of your parents are Danish, you are a Danish citizen. And until we get another citizenship in Greenland that is not Danish, it's a debate that is quite difficult to get past until we start pointing out who is it that is about to have this self-determination rule. Because it's so, a tricky subject. 
I'd love to, Miriam, I'd love to pass this on to you because um, what, what I understand or the, uh, what you have explained in terms of uh, in a New Zealand context. So uh, one of the questions that, uh, that are important speaking about Inuit identity and, and in indigeneity, if we can put it like that, how are things in New Zealand in terms of, um, of the indigenous identity? How, how do you define whether someone's Maori in, uh, or indigenous in New Zealand? Can you explain that, how, how that works there? Uh, sure. Uh, maybe I'll start by saying in general there are three sort of criteria that most places use to try and determine who's indigenous and who's not. Fundamentally, at um, the level of the UN, at the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, there is no definition of who makes an indigenous person. It's about self-identification. And indigenous rights, as we know, are collective rights. Self-identification is both about what you personally feel, who do you feel you are, do you feel like you're a member of this group, but it's also about whether the group recognises you as one of them. And then in some places there's also an emphasis on descent. Do you have a blood lineage um, to original Indigenous peoples? And there are challenges with all of these. In New Zealand... Um, in terms of when you're looking at claims to the to Tiriti or Waitangi, the um, Waitangi Tribunal in relation to the treaty, then the court just essentially says if you're Māori, then you can have standing before the court. How do you prove you're Māori? In fact, it's very rare that in proceedings before the court, that's something that you need to prove. You're usually coming there with the support of your iwi, people know who you are. It sort of isn't necessary to show an identity card or something like this to prove that you're a Māori, it's not in dispute. It's rare that that's a fact and issue, that that's something the court is trying to work out, are you actually Māori enough? So it doesn't come up in that same way. And, um, you know, Māori aren't... We talk about our salt, saltwater colonies, right? People who are living in the islands sort of have this right of territorial self-determination in a way that isn't recognised under Crown law in New Zealand in quite the same way. So it doesn't come up. The issues, of course, are... The reason that it's not defined in the UN Declaration, as many of you will know, is because it's supposed to be something that's worked out by the peoples themselves. How, how do we feel? How, what what's for us means that we are Inuit? What are the identifying factors? And one of the things that I think you've been saying a few times, Sven, that I think is a really interesting reflection is to think about which way round you want things to go. Do you want the law to come first, to say we need to claim these rights, this law that exists in international law, in domestic law, in Danish law, so we have to prove we're this thing to meet this legal requirement? Or is it better to first ask just, just who are we? What are the, how do we want to define ourselves? What are the facets of that? Obviously, I don't have the answer, and I'm sure it's a discussion you've all had many times and over a long period of time. The issue with blood quantum, with having uh, uh, that requirement as the main requirement or as one requirement or having passbooks or these things, is that in some parts of the world that's ended up being more dividing than it has been unifying. And in a moment where you're thinking about unifying people towards a common goal, maybe that's independence or free association or reconfiguring your governance arrangements, whatever they are, uh, making choices that might divide more of you than bring more of you together is a question you should ask and, and maybe reflect on other um, stories elsewhere. Mm. Yeah, I'll leave it there. And Sven, so I'd love to hear more. Maybe you, you uh, have a comment for, for what we've heard, but I'd also love to hear about um, your experience of what you learned from that day at the seminar, um, learning about free association. Well, yes, um, I think I'll come to that uh, later, but because I think that I want, would like to put out there that I think it, I'm amazed about our parliament position about defining our own identity. We have a self-rule act from, that was uh, agreed upon and effected from uh, 2009. It states that it's up to the Inuit uh, or the, the, the people of, 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 of Greenland to decide on independence. So it's already referred there who is actually uh, deciding when we have the vote about independence or not, who is able to vote. We cannot even move that forward. And I'm amazed that we are in that situation because our parliament 
is elected by the people and should work for the people. And I think it's a huge issue that we have and we haven't addressed it yet because deciding who is Inuit comes out of a decision in the parliament, first and foremost, that that decision to start the discussion about it is very important. And it's avoided and avoided through different, time, uh, different kinds of technical schemes. And I'm so disappointed because we should have gone further than that. And I, I would like to, to motivate uh, people out there that are listening to this that we should actually try to motivate our elected uh, representatives in our parliament to take that question up because it's uncertain now where we are. We can talk about uh, free association, we can talk about uh, independence and so forth, but we don't even have the first step cleared yet. And I, I think it's a pity. Right, so you're referring to the, to the fact that, that uh, in the Self-Rule Act, it says that it's the Greenlandic people that gets to decide or choose whether we want to become, become independent or not. So, Peter, maybe I'd like to, to uh, throw that ball to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because one of the main things that Miriam is talking about is they, when I say they, everybody else around the world seems to be the, under the impression that we are common about this goal. We are not. We are different people living in Greenland with different aims. And it's not supposed to be up to others what we want to do. That's what's written in the draft, or not the draft, the Sestrier uh, Commission, the Appendix 7. That's what it tried to say. It doesn't matter if it's block quantum or whatever method. It's, about to be, it's supposed to be the Greenlandic people that decides their own future. But people are so assimilated and used to, oh no, this is human rights. We are not allowed to distinguish between us. That it's kind of fizzling out in between nothing. And this is where I agree with Sven. We cannot even agree on an identity. Then right, so, how, so you how mean, should we even agree on anything else? Right, so defining the Greenlandic people, that, that is the, the first step that we're talking well, about. Well, so we, don't, we don't need to do it. We could also let everybody vote tomorrow and then decline independence. But what citizenship would you give to whom? Everybody right. that just lives in Greenland gets a Greenlandic citizenship. What about the Germans that are here on vacation? What about the uh, Italians that are up here working on a project? What about the Danes that actually don't want to be Greenlanders, that want to be stay Danish citizens? We don't have the distinction right now to say, you are all welcome. You'll get all the same rights. We just have one small issue that is protection of indigenous peoples in Greenland, as well as the Greenlandic people's rights. Mm. That should differ from settlers and people coming here just to work, because people tend to think that everybody that comes to Greenland wants to be a Greenlandic. Sven, your final thoughts? Yeah, because, yeah, because okay. we have to distinguish between permanent residence and citizenship. And I think that was abundantly clear when I participated in the, in the conference uh, at the university because there was this lawyer from Puerto Rico and said, come on, it doesn't mean that you're not welcome here. You just have to distinct between those two elements because I also talked about this, uh, um, I would say, an issue about uh, who's Inuit and who's not, who gets Greenlandic uh, citizenship and so forth. There was a person that I talked to who said, hey, come on, I live here, but I'm not interested in gaining Greenlandic citizenship or um, yeah, citizenship because I already have one. So he's a permanent resident and has, he has that ability to, to, to stay here indefinitely if he wants to, but he, is, he has a national, national ship in another country. And we should, we should actually try to look at that more broad because we don't exclude anybody, but it's about in which kind of uh, identifying box that you belong to, because not everybody wants to have Greenlandic citizenships when we are starting to handing them out to all that lives here, because some people have that in another place. It could be Danes, it could be Americans, it could be whatever, right? Mm. So unfortunately, we, we could keep talking about this. I'm sure we could talk for hours. Um, unfortunately, we are uh, running out of time, so 
one final last remark from all of you in terms of what we've uh, talked about. I'd love to hear that concluding remarks from, from starting from Pila. Well, one of the things that I love about discussions like that, this is that we actually get to hear about how do they do it other places. And also, as Goodman Dua said, there is actually a framework for this. It's not uncertain, but it seems like nobody knows what the basis is for these kinds of dis talks. So I'm very glad that we actually get people from around the world to give their two cents in on this discussion. And be it one way or the other, I do realize that even when people like me who never wanted to be a politician have to become politicians to change what we're doing, then we cannot just say it's up to the people. The politicians have to help spreading knowledge and making sure that people make, make informed decisions, not ba decisions on, based on feelings. Thank you, Peter. And Miriam, do you have any? Oh, gosh, I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I'm so aware that this is not my space um, and I uh, have to be careful about my own positionality. Um, but I would say that conversations without the politicians in the room are sometimes a good thing too. Um, particularly when you're talking about healing intergenerational traumas and about um, developing a sense of unity within a, a culture. Certainly from what I've witnessed both in Australia and in the Pacific, um, sometimes um, the quiet voices also need um, to be heard. I'll leave it there. Maybe uh, just to say if anyone... If anything that I'm working on is of interest, um, please do be in touch. I'm a public servant, so my salary is paid by the public, so I owe you all. Um, so if there's anything I can help with, please be in touch. Thank you. And Sven, final words. Yeah, well, I, I'm very happy to be uh, a part of this conference where I can at least contribute with some of my views on, on, on these topics. So uh, I was just going to say to everybody that are participating here physically, you're more than welcome to contact me in the, in the breaks and, uh, and see if we could bounce off uh, between us some different discussions and so forth. You're more than welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, all of you. I think uh, I'd love to maybe we have these gifts for, and we will make sure to send one for you, Good Mundua. Um, I'm sorry that the, that the sound didn't work out. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that in the future we, we have a chance to speak with you again where uh, the technical issues will not be <laughs> dominating. But uh, I think I'd, I'd love to thank all of you here and conclude this uh, panel debate. I hope you enjoyed it.